Okay, then let's begin. I only got 30 minutes, so I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, one specific uh, f facet of Systemd today, um, which is basically containers without a container manager. I mean, there have been quite a few container talks at this conference already, so I'm basically trying to um, adapt the stuff that uh, containers do and uh, step, uh, adapt them to uh, uh, normal system services directly. So it's kind of doing containers without actually being a container manager. Um, what are containers again? Lots of people have lots of different definitions. Um, like I think the three most relevant uh, parts of uh, what a container is are resource bundling, right? You have this one tarball or the squashFS image or whatever you have, um, and then contains all your dependencies. Um, so you get rid of the dependencies by simply bundling everything together. Um, there's always sandboxing involved, like namespacing um, and security, like seccomp and these kind of things. And there's an important component, which is delivery, so uh, where you can actually distribute it on your cluster. For this talk, I'm just going to focus on the first two, right? Resource bundling and sandboxing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can do these two things without actually involving a container manager at all, but just by using Systemd's own uh, service management functionality. So let's jump right in. The first thing, resource bundling. Um, in systemd, since pretty much um, uh, since its inception, we had this uh, setting root directory. It's uh, a one-to-one -one wrapper um, around Chroot, right? Like Chroot is the, like the prototypical pseudo uh, configuration, con uh, pseudo uh, uh, containerization feature that uh, Unix always had, um, and yeah, it used to be semi-useful, and nowadays it's actually pretty useful. Um, yeah, we'll come to that into more detail. Uh, what it ultimately does is it just invokes something with the uh, Chiroot environment um, set up, so that basically everything that shows up as uh, slash there is not what the host sees. Um, something that is much younger in systemd is pretty closely related to this, um, which is root image. Right, where root directory, where you specify a directory that shall be the root for that one specific service, root image, you can specify a disk image, right? Like a binary blob that contains a file system of some form. Uh, root image is actually pretty, pretty useful. Um, uh, the images that you can specify um, there can be completely regular disk images that uh, you could also pass to Kiimu or something like that. Everything that they need, they either need to be discoverable GPT, like GPT being the petition table logic and discoverable. By that, I mean that the, that the petition types are properly tagged as what they're actually used for, like, um, so that you can actually have a recognize simply by looking at the petition table which one is the root directory and which one is the home directory. Um, it also supports unambiguous GPT or MBR, where, which is not discoverable. By unambiguous, I just mean that if you have a petition table, that contains one petition only, um, then it's pretty obvious that that's probably the root petition, right? So, um, yeah, you can throw lots of different things at it. Um, either you stay, um, like, you avoid all the, unambig uh, the ambiguities, or you make it discoverable so that it's clear what it is. Or you can just point a raw file system to it, right? Like, no petition table at all. Um, you just generate something with squash, uh, make squashFS, or you, uh, you just create a loop device, put a file system on it. That's fine, too. Um, one tool to create these uh, images, of course, MKOSI, but actually can use whatever you like. Like you can use uh, DAP Bootstrap or YAM, whatever you do. MKOSI is a tool that I have been working on um, uh, in the past months. It's uh, supposed to be um, like a wrapper on ultimately around the Bootstrap and DNF, but it has a couple of bells and whistles that make it a little bit nicer to use. Um, uh, for example, it can do cryptography for you. Um, which is actually pretty interesting, like uh, this root image setting and, and systemd unit files actually can do cryptography for you as well, right? You can actually encrypt the images that you want to run there and systemd will handle that properly. I think encryption is not that interesting for service management, but something closely related to it actually is, I think, which is DM Verity. For those who don't know, DM Verity is, is a, a system that um, protects file systems for modification, right? It was created f uh, originally for the Chrome OS project because they wanted to make sure that offline modification of the Chromebooks is not possible, meaning that you can uh, leave your laptop in some unsupervised area and uh, people cannot just take out the hard disk, modify it, put it back in and you would not notice. But instead, that every single read access is cryptographically verified so that you detect um, changes. How does that all apply to service management? 
um, basically, if you use DM Verity protected disk images, you can uh, deploy your service um, on your on your systems and can be sure that when they run, they run in the exact version that you prepared and that nobody has interfered um, offline with them, like, for example, during the downloading or, or while the system was already running. Um, this is not useful for everybody, but it's certainly useful for a lot of people. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, root image and root directory are just a fancy to root. Um, in fact, root directory is ultimately implemented with a true root system call, at least under normal conditions. Not always, but usually. Um, true roots are highly problematic in many ways. Like they, they. I mean, you can make them work if you are if you know what you're doing, but they come with lots of uh, problems. Like uh, one of them is, of course. Um, uh, you first have to mount the API file systems into them, right? Like slash proc slash this, otherwise the program will not actually run from this environment because it's not there. That's something we handle in systemd with uh, mount APV, VV, API v, v, Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, it's a boolean. If you set it, then it makes sure that after rooting into this thing, you also get the proxes and dev file systems there so that everything just works. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is how to share data. Um, on Unix, there's bind mounts for that. Um, bound, bind mounts are excellent. Um, traditionally, if you would use normal to root, how people usually traditionally used it is they would establish these bind mounts on the host, so it would always show up in the mount table of the host. In systemd with unit files, you can use bind path and bind read only path, which basically allow you to map anything from the host into anything um, into the to root environment. Um, and it will only show up in the mount table of the service itself, so it will not pollute um, your host. Um, it's, it's actually that easy to use, so I'm not going to go into detail with what you do there. You just specify either one path or path path um, that specify a mapping what from the host should show up where inside of the true root environment. Um, re pretty much related to this is a relatively new feature of systemd, um, like uh, the set of uh, runtime directory, state directory, cache directory, logs directory, configuration directory. Because usually, um, if you want to ship your service as a bundle, right, like as an ideally an, um, a bundle that only contains the actual operating system executables, then it's still interesting to actually have um, data, like changeable data route that reside on the host system, right? Specifically, you want something like runtime uh, data, which is like a, a, a AF Unix socket or, or something like that. You want a state directory where you can actually your service can put stuff and it stays around. You want a cache directory where you, your service can put stuff and uh, which is non-essential data, so that if it's flushed out, it's not bad. If it's there, it optimizes things. Uh, you might want to configure a logs directory, which is uh, yeah, where your service can put logs and a configuration directory where it can put configuration. If you use these settings in unit files um, together with uh, root directory or root image, then this will a little bit work like bind pass work, like it's going to be mounted from the host into the, into the uh, to root environment. Um, however, it comes with a couple of bells and whistles, like uh, um, these directories, the source directories are automatically created in their lifetime like because the system knows about them, it can uh, life cycle them together with the service itself. Like for example, runtime directory, um, if you use that, it's, it will automatically create a um, directory for you that has this uh, in slash run, like which is where all the runtime stuff uh, belongs, um, that is automatically life cycled together with the service itself, right? So you can like, let's say you're Nginx, um, you are packaged as one of these bundles and then uh, uh, you want to have your run nginx directory, and uh, you can just specify it with runtime directory, and that basically means that the nginx uh, slash run slash nginx directory is created the instance the service has created itself, and goes away automatically when the service is shut down. Um, the other ones are similar to this actually, but it's basically a way how you can bundle everything in a in a, in, a, in a resource bundling way, in a very nice way, but you can still share specific things and uh, have them reside on the host, right? Which is nice for updates, for example, because if it's on the host, it will um, be unaffected by updates or not as directly affected by updates, and you can uh, update the bundles independently of that. Um, yeah, these things are also pretty nice because they keep bundles self-contained. 
right? Like because I mean, traditionally, if you install a, a Unix service on some some uh, system, they will run things like temp files do or something like that, where they create additional directories in the in the file system hierarchy at uh, any kind of place. But if we actually are interested in the bundling concept, then it's kind of like that we don't need to do that, at least if um, all we want to do is have a runtime directory, state directory, cache directory, logs directory, or configuration directory. Um, by the way, so the runtime directory that was um, slash run uh, is like a subdirectory of slash run that you configure that way. The state directory is a subdirectory of var lib that you configure this way. The cache directory is a directory in var cache that you configure this way. Logs directory, you guessed it probably, is var log. And configuration directory is a subdirectory of Etsy that you configure this way. So, yeah, that's that. A bigger problem. Um, so this is how, how you can share data between um, having a bundled service like this and, uh, and the host or other stuff. Um, but the bigger problem with Truth classically is how to share the user table, right? Because uh, on Unix, of course, the user table is uh, usually um, maintained in Etsy PassWD. Um, if you have a, have a Truth environment and the Etsy PassWD of the Truth environment um, is different from the one from the host, because you still live in the, in the same world, um, it can become a bit of a problem because the idea of who user Leonard is on the host might be quite different from the idea that Truth sees there. Um, this is only a problem if you use Truths without p user namespaces and PID namespaces. I mean, it's actually a problem that um, things like Docker have as well, except that the Docker people usually don't tell you about this problem. Um, and it's not as, visual, uh, not, uh, not as visible because if you disconnect the PID namespaces from each other, right? Like if you can't see the process of the other users, it's not as visible that they still run as the same users. Um, but yeah, I mean, the solution, the general solution is to actually use the namespaces, which we, we'll talk about here, um, which aren't yet that adopted on Linux, I figure, because they're hard to use. Um, and if you ask me, they're kind of incomplete. <laughs> but yeah, so the question is, again, what do you do if you have your bundled service and uh, you want to use root image in a, a systemd service file? Um, and so what do you do about the uh, user database? My suggestion to, the, to do that is not share it at all. Instead, uh, there's this Boolean option called private users um, for services. If you turn it on, this basically disconnects the user tables of the uh, uh, service that the service sees from the one from the host. This is ultimately implemented with UserNS. Um, but uh, in, instead of pretending that UserNS was a solution for everything and exposing the full functionality, it will expose it in one very, very specific way. So what it does, um, it, will, um, it will basically install a mapping so that the root user of the host shows up as the root user that the container, like the service sees. The nobody user of the host will show up as the nobody user that the service sees. The user of the service itself will also be mapped like this, and everything else is mapped to the nobody user, right? This basically means it doesn't really matter what the bundled thing actually has an Etsy pass WD because we don't really care. We only care for the root user, for the nobody user, and for the um, service user itself. And the, um, the uh, root user and the nobody user is actually the only one where all the distributions tend to agree uh, which user ID they actually have, right? User ID root always has UID zero and user ID nobody, uh, user nobody has uh, user ID 6553, whatever. Yeah, um, you get the concepts. So with private users, you can disconnect that. So all the other users, like the other regular users that you might see in PS or something, don't actually matter anymore. Um, and then there's another module called NSS systemd, which synthesizes user entries for root and nobody, which basically means um, if you have this NSS systemd enabled, which um, the distributions increasingly have, then uh, um, you don't actually need Etsy passed over at all, because uh, these direct uh, these users, which everybody agrees on, will exist anyway, regardless if Etsy passed WD uh, exists or not, because the NSS system systemd is a module that is loaded into the user management of Linux and will make sure that they always show up. There's one piece missing in this. Um, it's like uh, if you have a bundled service, right? if you have a service that uses root directory or root image, um, how do you make sure that uh, from inside of, the, of the, uh, uh, this environment you actually see that the user ID you're running as has a specific name? Um, I have some ideas about this. It's going to be very technical, so I'm going to skip over this bit, but yeah. So much about the bundling, right? 
the essence of everything I told you really is uh, use root directory and root image if you want bundling with normal services. It should just work, and you can use standard images. Um, and uh, with the private user thing, you can deal with the user database change. But yeah, the other part of containers, right, besides this, uh, um, the bundling is, of course, sandboxing. And sandboxing is something we added a lot of features recently to systemd. Um, yeah, basically all my remaining slides are just about specific sandboxing features. We'll go quickly through them. Like one, um, like I blocked about this one. Um, it's actually one of the more interesting ones. It's, you know how on classic Unix um, services used to be sandboxed, right? Like it's all about user IDs. Um, it's like how we have been doing since, since the 90s or even before. Like the Apache user has had, a, had HTTPD or something. Uh, um, Apache is running as that. And because it's not root that it's running as, um, it cannot access whatever else is, being, uh, is happening on the system. And traditionally, this is how we put together our Unix systems, right? Every system service we had had its own user ID it was running as and was thus isolated to some way um, from everything else. It is, if you so will, the quintessential sandboxing technology that Unix always had. It kind of, um, it's, I mean, it's widely adopted, but it's also, um, it, it's kind of frozen in time, right? It has this problem that it's, it's very expensive to actually allocate a user because they, the system users um, that there are, um, they, I mean, most of the distribution define that like, you can ha have at most uh, 1,000 system users. So if you install 1,000 services or something, you become a problem. Uh, you have a problem. This basically means that uh, um, you cannot just allocate users traditionally just like that, use them for something, and then release them uh, because there are simply too few of them to actually do this. And even if you did, um, there's a general problem on, on Unix that there is no scheme to actually release um, the ownership of a system user ID again. Because you have the problem that uh, user ID ownership, right, the ownership of a, of a file directory or IPC object or, or whatever else Linux maintains, um, is bound to user ID, like a numeric ID. So at the time you, you create that object, um, the object becomes owned by that user ID. Now, um, if you want to reuse the user ID for different purposes, because you only have 1,000 of them, um, you would have to first make sure that you have to release th um, the original resource, like a file directory, IPC object, and, and so on. But that's incredibly hard, because you would have to scan the entire file system for this. Um, and uh, what do you do if uh, a, a user owned a file on some some file system is currently not mounted, so you cannot really properly solve that. So most distributions, hence, um, they just declare for s uh, safety reasons, we'll never actually uh, release user IDs again. So if you install a package and you remove it, um, then it, most of the files are removed, but the, but the system users that are allocated are not. So um, you leave a major artifact um, in the system, and given that there are only 1,000 of them, that's pretty nasty. In systemd, in the, in the systemd 235, um, the most re recently released one, we have uh, the, the, the dynamic user concept, which basically um, use a couple of tricks to make this all more bearable, right? So it's a Boolean option. If you uh, turn it on for a service, it basically means that the instant the service starts, um, uh, a new system user is allocated, and the instant the service shuts down, it's released again. How do we deal with these problems that I mentioned, that the fact that user ID ownership is, uh, is uh, uh, sticky on Unix? Um, there are two strategies to that. One of them is we forbid creating objects um, uh, in most ways. This basically, for example, means that we use a couple of other sandboxing options that I'll talk about later um, that basically ensure that uh, the service has very few directories that it actually can write to. And if it can't write to anything, it of course cannot actually leave objects around owned by this user. Another strategy is to uh, define some specific areas where the service can write to after all, but then destroy these areas the instance the service goes down, right? Specifically, um, that's private TMP, for example. It's a simple bool you, uh, that is set for the service, and it's actually implied if you set dynamic user for the service. And it basically means that you that the service, as long as run, has a private directory in slash temp that appears as its own slash temp, um, and that goes away automatically when the service goes down. So two strategies forbid writing, and we do write, um, uh, make sure that it is removed again afterwards. So that's our strategy there. Um, yeah, dynamic user is also pretty nice because it uh, keeps bundles self-contained, right? Like traditionally, if you install a system user, you drop in a users D drop in, or you invoke add user or something in your RPM or something like that. Um, 
but uh, yeah, that basically means you need need to distribute f stuff in the uh, in the whole um, uh, on the whole uh, file system, and this way you don't have to do that because the service file contains all the information about the user that needs to be allocated, um, and it's it's nicely self-contained and it leaves no artifacts in the system. So yeah, the focus is really on leaving no artifacts. Um, one other sandboxing object uh, concept pretty closely related to this actually is remove IPC. It basically just says that um, system 5 and post 6 IPC uh, uh, objects that are created by the service get automatically removed when the service goes down. Um, you know, POSIX, like it's, the, the, the IPC systems are usually not that visible to administrators, but it's how processes communicate on Linux. Um, if it's a Boolean, it's also implied by a dynamic user, but you can use it for everything else as well. If you set it basically um, and the service goes down, we iterate through the list of currently allocated IPC objects and remove every single one that matches the user ID that your service ran as. Whereas private TMP, I already mentioned that, gives you this private slash temp that is lifecycle bound to your service itself. The result of this is again, no artifacts left, right? Like you start the service, you shut it down, and all your temporary files and all your IPC objects go away with the service. There's another option, which is uh, private devices. Um, I mean, you know, all these options, like they, they are much more fine-grained than what you traditionally can do with, with uh, containers, right? Like containers are by default locked down very much and very much disconnected from the host. You don't see the process table, you don't see the user table, or at least you think you don't use it, see the user table, but actually you do. Um, you don't get access to devices and things like that. In systemd, because we're coming the other way, traditionally the services um, run without, like with most privileges, because that's how system 5 and it works, we do go the other way around. We lock things down bit by bit. I wish it wasn't so, of course, because security is always better if you're coming from the from the lockdown version and um, bit by bit opens things up. But it, we can't for the due to the system five heritage. But um, uh, still, like so, yeah. So these individual bits, if you take them, uh, use them uh, bit by bit, um, you can build a very nice sandbox. But you, of course, have to turn them on all individually. Um, yeah, private devices basically gives you a private instance of slash dev that doesn't contain any real devices, right? Um, it, what it does provide you in slash dev, though, is the pseudo devices like um, uh, dev null, dev zero, dev uh, uh, random, dev view run them, which aren't real devices. Like, I mean, there's no, not a physical um, PCI card or something behind that. It's just the way how Linux likes to expose its, its APIs. So, uh, and uh, in contrast, so, like, they're, they're in contrast to, let's say, Dev SDA, which is actually a physical device, it's your hard disk, or to uh, uh, Dev Sound whatever, which is actually your sound card. So um, with private devices, basically, you get disconnected from that. You still get the API block uh, uh, um, character devices, but you do not get anything else. It's like, unless your service um, needs actual physical hardware access, and almost no service does, it's the great Boolean to set. There's private network, which um, uses network namespacing to disconnect you from the host network. For every service that doesn't need networking, it's a great thing to do. Very recently, we added uh, something more fine grained, which is uh, a little bit like a firewall, where you can basically configure um, for your service um, which uh, IP address it shall be able to access. You can specify that simply by IP address and a net mask, and it just works. Um, there are a couple of more uh, things like that. For example, Protect Kernel Tunables takes away the access to proxies for the service. Protect Kernel Modules takes away the access to load kernel modules for a service. It's all booleans, by the way. A protect control groups takes away the right to uh, make changes to the control group file system. Um, yeah, then there's a system call fi filter, which uh, allows to apply a specific system call filters to a service so that it can lock it down uh, so that um, dangerous system calls, like, for example, setting the system clock or sh rebooting the system are not viable. Um, it's pretty hard to use, or traditionally it's pretty hard to use because uh, who actually knows all the system calls that you want to list there. Um, it's a lot simpler now because we have system call groups, which are basically named groups that make it easier to uh, um, enable and disable specific facets. Um, I got like uh, five minutes left now. Um, there are quite a few more, and I think it's not bad at all that we can't talk about all of them. I'll just quickly, like, with one of them you can restrict address families, like socket address families. With one, you can uh, um, restrict the system call architectures, blah, 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 blah. Um, the message you should get from all of these 
are we have all these uh, sandboxing options these days, and you can use them. Um, like, uh, I mean, m much of this, not all of this, but much of this is applied by a, a container manager as well to the containers it's running. But uh, the message you really should take home is that uh, you don't, if, if that's what you're in for, um, if that's what you're looking for, then you can just do that for normal services as well. Just set these booleans um, on bit by bit, and you can run your stuff in a very locked down version. So, yeah. This is not supposed to be an, a replacement for a container manager, not at all. Right, but uh, the reason why I'm doing this talk is mostly because um, I work for Red Hat, right? And I know, um, like, I, I come in contact with lots of people who use um, containers for various different things, right? Like, uh, because uh, containers are like the big word. Um, everybody tries to fit his specific problem into the container world. Like, for example, I met with storage people who want to ship their storage management stuff as a container, and that's certainly great thing to do until you notice that, well, if you want to manage storage, you actually need um, hardware access, like like block device access. And as soon as you do block device access, you you becomes really really hard with Docker because it's um, not designed that way because it actually is supposed to take away the rights for you. Um, so. And then there are lots of stories like that, where people see containers as the solution for everything and then try to uh, fit it into the problem set they have. Most of these times they just say, OK, you're actually interested in the sandboxing, or A, you're interested in the bundling, but you're not actually so much interested in the rest of it. Um, the message I really want to get across is that, yeah, it's a fluid thing, right? Like. Uh, maybe containers is actually not the solution for you. Maybe you can use just plain service management and turn on the sandboxing, and there you go. Or maybe you can use um, plain service management and turn on the resource bundling, and there you go, and it solves your problems as well. Now, I think I got like four minutes left, so maybe we should do questions. Um, if anybody has a question, um, there's a question. Um, based on the current state of SystemD, how far do you think you're along to the path of portable systems? Uh, portable system service, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, service. my last slide here was about the outlook for that. So, um, portable service is something I've been uh, working on in the longer run, which is supposed to be something where you really just can drop in a service, uh, a bundle, like an image file, and then systemd will deal with the rest of it. Basically, um, it, it's way how everything that I presented on my slides is just pulled together in one tool and makes it nice. We, at this point, we're basically there, right? Like all the individual building blocks that I want for the portable services are there. It's just a matter of writing this generator that uh, looks at um, the image files you drop in, pulls out the relevant service files, makes them available on the host system, um, points them back so that root directory or root image is used onto the original image um, so that they appear as a native um, uh, service. So it's mostly there. It's just about writing this generator um, to make it all like fit it all together. It's one of the things that I have on my to list next, basically. It was a long way to go there and um, uh, to get there because, I mean, doing adding all the sandboxing features, adding all the image handling fixes, adding like figuring out what we actually want to do with the user database into root environments and things like that, that was a lot of work. Um, but uh, nowadays, it's really it's pretty much just actually doing the generator. Oh, by the way, what uh, something that's also really important to, me to mention is like because these bits are so fine grained and you can pick exactly what you want. Um, what you can also do is like use this to um, hook random other stuff up to system D um, and make it run as a as a native system D unit. Like for example, you could probably um, just use uh, write a generator that now uses an OCI image or something like that and dynamically converts it into a unit file with the generator. I mean, for those who don't know what generators are, generators are a systemd concept, how you can um, uh, convert dynamically foreign stuff that wants to run as a service to into systemd unit files. We originally created that to convert system5 units, uh, like system5 init scripts dynamically into uh, system to units, but it's actually way more powerful than that. You can use it for all kinds of other stuff. So um, uh, what I basically wanted to say here is now is that um, while I think uh, the portable services are a great way forward, um, none of this technology is specific to that, right? Like you can stick it uh, together in completely different ways, write a generator from UCI to this, and it will uh, work too. Any other questions? Nobody has a question. There's a question. You said that uh, user namespaces were kind of incomplete. Could you elaborate a bit on why why you think that is? 
why it is or how it is. Um, how it is. <laughs> I don't know. You guys, namespaces have been around for a while, but I don't think they... I mean, you can make them use for specific use cases. For example, Flatpak is probably one of the more uh, sensible uses where it's being used. But in general, you know, we are lacking um, a, a shift file system, like a UID shift file system. So it basically means that whenever you actually want to use uh, UID namespaces um, the way they originally intended them to be used, and you have to shift around all the UIDs in your image, because otherwise everything will be owned by user nobody, and that's usually not how systems work, right? And the fact that you have to shift around, right, that you have to, to do a recursive chone is just awful. That's not sought to the end. Um, other than that, it's probably the major security vulnerability in the kernel in the last months or years or something, right? Um, I don't know. I don't think it... I mean, it's super complex. I don't think it's sought to the end. I think it's very hard to use. Um, uh, I think uh, it's, it's way over-designed because it allows arbitrary map mappings from any user table to any other user table. Um, I also think it's a problem that suddenly um, systems have much smaller user tables, right? Like Because uh, you always have to slice up the 32-bit you have into smaller bits. And I don't know. It's it's it's. I mean, we make use of it like private um, uh, user. The, the boolean is, is, is uses it, but I don't think it's sought to the end. And I don't think there are any deployments, right? Maybe Docker has code for it right now, but I'm not entirely sure that they actually people run it in the full mode how it's intended to be. It appears to me very much like something is still in progress and has been in progress for the last five years or something, and probably will continue to be in progress for the next five years or something until we get a shift FS or something in the kernel, which doesn't look very likely at this moment, as far as I know, at least. Any other questions? Okay, I think the time's over. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and uh, Chris will probably do more announcement now, so please stay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Leonard.